So what is color really? And how do we measure it? And how do we change it? There are many ways to break down color. I'm sure you've heard of most of them. Digital screens, for example, display color based on RGB values, measuring the amount of red, green, and blue in each color pixel. Printers break it down via CMYK, how much cyan, magenta, yellow, and black is in each color. There are also other models such as the hex code system that you've probably seen for color swatches, maybe at a paint shop or in web design. Now, clearly these systems are designed for computers to encode and decode because if I toss you this shade of blue, it'll hardly be intuitive to you what the ratio of RGB components in here is, right? So what model do we as colorists use when creating, measuring and modifying colors? The easiest format to use is HSL and that stands for Hue Saturation Luminance. You might also see this written as HSB, brightness instead of luminance, or HSV, value instead of luminance. This model is super tangible for us to understand. So let's take a look at an example. We'll start with this teal and its corresponding H, S, and L values. Now, if I shift the hue, you'll see the hue change while the saturation and luminance remain constant. And of course, the same thing will happen vice versa with the other two sliders. Here, I'm only changing the saturation. And lastly, I'm isolating the luminance. Now, let's try matching this variable color to this reference swatch. First, we'll try to match the hue. Then we can raise or lower the saturation. And lastly, the luminance. We may have to go back and forth between these values to get a close match, but nevertheless, it's fortunately quite intuitive to break down color this way. You've probably seen the HSL method of breaking down color before, possibly without even knowing it. If you go into the Photoshop color picker, you'll see values for H, S, and B, which I mentioned is the same as HSL. If you click on any of these, you can adjust the slider over here. And you can also use the grid over to the left to adjust the two other values. So for example, if I have hue pulled up on the slider, I'll have saturation and luma over to the left. Saturation will be left to right, and you can see the number value change over here, and Luma will be top to bottom. Just a cool note, you'll also be able to spot some of those other color measuring methods that we discussed earlier over here. RGB, CMYK, and hex. All right, so let's apply all of this knowledge about HSL to the color wheel. Now, a quick but really important thing to look out for first is to always work with an RGB color wheel, not an RYB wheel. An RYB wheel will have red, yellow, and blue spaced equidistantly on the wheel. So if you draw a triangle, it'll, it'll hit red, yellow, and blue. This is the color wheel used for mixing paint, so you'll probably remember it from art class in elementary school, and you might stumble across it in, you know, art stores or at Home Depot or something. But the color wheel that we use for all digital color is RGB. It has a slightly different color distribution as it's based on how we see light. You'll find if you look at that same equidistant triangle, it now matches up with red, green, and blue instead of red, yellow, and blue. This is just something really important to look out for as it affects all the color relationships. All right, so now that that's settled, let's take a closer look. There are a couple of different variations of the color wheel, but they'll all have one thing in common. They'll have the different hue values distributed as you go around the circle. Towards the center of the circle, the wheels might differ. On some, the color will desaturate as you move towards the center. On others, the color will desaturate and brighten towards the center. Ultimately, the limitation of any color wheel is that we can only store two pieces of information here, the hue plus one other value going towards the center. So where do we store the third value of HSL? Technically, if we want to map out hue, saturation, and luminance in a complete way, we will need to do it via a cylinder. So take the color wheel and make it three-dimensional. And now we have three ways to store information. The hue goes around the circle from red to blue to green and back to red. The saturation goes towards the inside of the circle, so more saturation towards the outside and less towards the inside. And the luminance is raised and lowered based on the cylinder height. Higher is brighter and lower is darker. 
Now, in most platforms, we don't really use the cylinder view as it's unnecessarily complicated and not super intuitive. So instead, we usually just map out the color wheel and then use the sliders for the rest. So here I am in Adobe Color, for example, and I'm in HSB mode. Now I can move the nodes on the color wheel and around the perimeter of the circle, we of course have the hue values change. Towards the inside and the outside, we have the saturation value change. And if we want to modify the luminance, we can use the luminance slider down here. Technically, we also have sliders for saturation and hue if we would prefer those, but luminance is the only one where we are sort of required to use the slider because we don't have the height of the cylinder mapped out here. Okay, so let's start thinking about how we can apply all of this information to shifting colors in images. The tools we have in Photoshop almost all work by adding color on top of what is already present. The luma aspect of colors is pretty easy to manipulate, right? Raising and lowering of exposure is, is pretty intuitive. However, manipulating hue and sometimes saturation takes a bit of practice. So say we want to change the color of a certain element, such as this dress. It is currently blue, but we maybe want it to be purple. What color would we need to add to the blue to make the dress purple? Combining colors is easiest to visualize on the color wheel. Let's take a look at the basic rule here. If you combine two colors equally, the result will be directly in the middle. So it works kind of like mixing paint in a bucket. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. If we take this red and yellow and we combine them equally, the result will be right between the two. So orange. And if we start with red and only add a tiny bit of yellow, we'll still move towards orange, just not as far. All right, next let's try blue and green. If we combine these two equally, the result will be cyan. If we take blue and just add a little bit of green, we'll slightly go into the direction of cyan, but not quite. Now, it gets a little tricky when you start combining colors that are further away from each other. For example, adding blue to yellow. You might think that the result may be red or maybe green because that's kind of halfway between them, but it actually works exactly the same as before. So draw a straight line connecting the two and the result will be halfway. So in this case, that would be gray. Yep, that's actually correct. The two opposite colors cancel each other out. Okay, so what if, for example, you take yellow and you only add a tiny bit of blue instead of mixing them equally? Well, you'll just sort of slightly desaturate the yellow, but not fully cancel it out to gray. All right, so this rule can be applied to any two colors on the color wheel. Let's make this exercise a little more practical because when we're coloring an image, we usually have the initial color, you know, whatever is present in the image, and we have a result in mind, i.e. which color we would like to change it to. So now we need to find out what to add to our initial color or in which direction to shift it to yield the desired result. As I mentioned, almost all coloring tools in Photoshop work additively like this, so as soon as this formula becomes intuitive to you, you can use it with pretty much 90% of coloring tools. So let's draw it out. In our first example, we have cyan and we want green. In which direction do we need to pull our cyan? Towards yellow. So if we add yellow to the cyan, it will turn green. Now let's try shifting this magenta to red. Which color do we need to add? Well, we're moving away from blue and towards orange, so Let's add orange. Orange plus magenta equals red. And what if we don't want to be halfway, but rather a little closer to orange? Well, we can just add more orange or even some yellow if we want to move the hue further along in that direction. Now, you might notice that when we combine two colors, especially if they're spaced out a bit, the result will sometimes not be as far out on the color wheel as we'd like, i.e. the color will be desaturated in the shifting process. So for example, if we combine blue and red, we'll receive purple, but it might not be as saturated as our initial colors. The good thing is if we already have the purple hue set, the only thing we need to do to make it more saturated is add more purple. 
And of course, the opposite would be if we wanted to desaturate the purple, we would add the opposite of purple, which would be a little bit of yellow. All of this definitely becomes intuitive with time. An analogy I really like to think about is um, that the color that I'm adding is kind of like a magnet, so it pulls the result into its direction. And depending on how much I add, that's how strong the magnet is. So um, that's, I guess, kind of a fun way to think about it. Okay, to wrap up this section, let's discuss an important limitation of hue shifts. Say, for example, we have cyan and want to change it to red. Following our previous rule of drawing a line through them and kind of seeing what's on the other side, well, there's nothing there. It's literally off the color wheel. So if you've ever tried to shift a color into its complete opposite, you will have noticed how extremely difficult that is. The sort of traditional math doesn't really work here. So um, some of our options would include to take multiple steps of coloring to shift the hue around one side of the color wheel, sort of one hue at a time. Or we could also desaturate the cyan to gray and then tint it red artificially. But I will say both of those options might result in something that looks quite unnatural or these techniques might even do image damage since they are just such drastic moves. So generally, I would recommend avoiding changing hues to their opposite or almost their opposite whenever possible. Okay, so that wraps up all of our foundation and basic theory.